Over the past few years, I've been fortunate enough to interview some of Kurt Cobain's friends. People who were not just friends of his, but who also happened to work with Nirvana in one way or another. Steve Albini, the main producer on In Utero, Jack Endino, the producer on Bleach, whose production work is also on Incesticide, as well as the photographers Charles Peterson and Alice Wheeler. I also got to interview Gary Cobain, Kurt Cobain's uncle, but I'm making a separate video about that entirely. These interviews were all part of my documentary called Rock is Dead, and in that film I explore a variety of subjects, specifically how has the internet changed the music business and what does it mean particularly for rock bands. If you want to see that film, the link is in the description box below, and I've also pinned it as a top comment. But back to Kurt Cobain specifically. The one common thing that all of his friends who I spoke to said to me is that Kurt was human. In other words, he wasn't this sort of immortal figure that he's been made out to be by the public and by the media. He was a person. One of the things about Kurt Cobain and Nirvana that I find appealing is that Kurt very much was an imperfect person. And to me, that's such a breath of fresh air because today there's just, you know, a slew of modern, you know, stars who I feel often try to portray themselves as like this perfect, you know, individual. But we all know there's no such thing as a perfect individual. As I've said, I'm a fan of Nirvana, I'm a fan of Kurt, even though I'm not a fan of everything about Kurt. There are certain things about him that I don't admire, but that's okay because no one in the world is perfect. There are things about all of us that we can work on and improve, and to expect that you have to 100% admire someone in order to like them or be a fan of them, in my opinion, is very unhealthy. When Kurt became as big as he did, his humanity was overlooked in a way. He became the celebrity. He was no longer the person. Everybody wanted something out of him. Take a look at this clip I have from Steve Albini talking about what it was like just being Nirvana for a day. On the very first day at the studio, um, someone came in with a manila envelope full of legal documents that they all had to sign. You know, just a stack of them, you know. And they were well, everything from some functional thing, like this is so that you can collect royalties on uh, radio play in territories controlled by Australia. You know, all right, okay, well, fine, whatever. All right, this is so they can use a photograph of you on a magazine cover to promote this thing. Okay, whatever. This is a lawsuit where somebody had a band called Nirvana and he wants to get paid off because your band is called Nirvana. Okay, here, fine, fuck it, whatever. You know, this is some kid who broke her leg at a show and wants you to pay something extra because you were playing it. Okay, fine, fuck it, whatever. You know, like, just a stream of these things came in the very first day. I've never had to deal with anything like that in my life, you know? But that was just, you know, another another day in the band of Nirvana for them. You know, they just had to deal with shit like that constantly. So it was obvious to me that they were under, a, you know, pressures of a different magnitude than anybody that I dealt with. And so I, I made a, I tried to make a point of not pressing them for any indulgences. Like, I didn't want I didn't pretend to be an intimate friend with any of them. They were had all these people that were trying to leech onto them and trying to weasel their way into their inner circle. I didn't want to be one of those people. They had people asking them for things constantly, you know, mementos or indulgences or tickets or autographs or pictures like I didn't want to be one of those people. So I gave them not just space, but autonomy and uh, a distance between them and me that respected how much they already had to put up with and that I wasn't going to be an additional burden to them. You know, I, I guess in a nutshell, speaking to Kurt's friends, it really shows how much she meant to them. And the most important message, the thing that they all emphasized, the ones who I, who really spoke to me about this topic and who really opened up to me about this, it really emphasize they really emphasize that Kurt was a person first and foremost, and that they don't remember him as Kurt the rock star. They remember him as Kurt the friend. And I think the biggest lesson there that we can all take is that 
regardless of what we achieve in life, regardless of where we go in life, the people who really matter to you, you should matter to them because of who you are as a person, not because of your status and vice versa. Your status, hey, I mean, if you can achieve something spectacular in a professional sense in your life, that's amazing. Why not? Pursue it. But really, being famous doesn't automatically make you happy. It doesn't automatically make your life amazing. Some of the happiest people I know are people that have almost nothing. Like I, I've met some people in my life that don't have what you would think is necessary to have even a basic happy life, yet they're some of the happiest people I know. Some people I know that have almost everything are miserable. In my opinion, I think a lot of people think that when they get famous, if they ever do, that being famous will somehow compensate for whatever else they're missing in their lives. You know, fame in and of itself will not sustain long-term happiness. That's a really important lesson, I think, that we can all learn from many, many examples. You know, there's nothing wrong with pursuing fame. There's nothing wrong with pursuing fame. I think if that's what you want to do, go for it. But don't expect that becoming famous is automatically going to make you happy because in the long run, it won't.